Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Jokum. I am the Director of Business and Membership Development for the Longview Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you to our Ask the Attorney webinar today. Uh, it is just a gorgeous day outside, so I hope that wherever you are, you're sitting by a window, or maybe you're even working re remotely on your back porch. I don't know. But regardless of where you are, we are so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, we want to let you know about a few housekeeping items. First of all, this webinar is being recorded, and it would, will be made available online on our website, longviewchamber.com. And uh, for those of you on the line today, you'll also receive an email later today with a link to listen again or to share with others, and you'll also receive a PDF of the presentation today. A um, couple of features to make you aware of on the on the webinar uh, platform. First of all, you're going to be muted throughout the presentation, um, but you will have an opportunity to ask questions, so be thinking about questions you may have for our presenter. Um, you should be able to hear the presenter and also see the visual presentation. Um, if you're at your computer now and don't see the visual visual presentation or the or the the green opening slide that we have there with my picture and our speaker's picture on there, um, it's possible that maybe you haven't clicked the little button at the bottom on your bottom toolbar. There's a little uh, icon that looks like a flower. That's the go to webinar icon. Uh, so click that and maybe then you hopefully see the uh, presentation. Um, there is a questions section uh, on the uh, should be on the right hand side of your your desktop, and uh, you can use that feature to either send a message to um, our organizer. If you're having any kind of technical trouble, uh, just shoot a message there, and they will uh, try to help you out with those issues. And that's also where you're going to type in any questions that you may want to ask of the presenter any time during the presentation. You can just type a question in there. And then we'll we'll field those questions uh, at the end of the the presentation. Um, we'll have opportunity for for that Q and A time. So uh, we want you to know, as the Longview Chamber of Commerce, uh, we have been thinking of you. We've been doing a lot of planning, a lot of gathering of information over the last few weeks with everything that's going on, and uh, we certainly recognize that this is a challenging season for our business community and and for our individual community members at large. And uh, we know that our business community really is looking for answers to important questions that, that you have. Um, and while we don't have all the answers, we do have access. That's one thing we do have is access to uh, experts uh, in specific areas that can help provide you a place to start in getting your questions answered. I know sometimes in all the information you're getting from all the different places, uh, you get an answer to one question, and it just it just makes you have six more questions. So, we hopefully can, with these webinars that we're doing, help alleviate some of that some of that pain that you're feeling. Today, we are blessed to have a local professional. He is a partner with Boone, Koch, Eccles, Coleman, and Goolsby PLLC law firm. Casey Goolsby will be presenting on business issues concerning the coronavirus. Casey focuses his practice on civil litigation, personal injury, and wrongful death, business, consumer, collections, and appellate law, and patent litigation. And Casey, I hope that I said all of that correctly. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for uh, being our presenter today. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, as you said, my name is Casey Goolsby. I'm a partner here with Boone, Kalk, Eccles, Coleman, and Goolsby here in Longview. And I first of all want to give my thoughts to everyone going through this crazy time, especially in light of yesterday's shelter in place orders, uh, the quarantine issues that are going on. And so it's a very, very difficult time for everybody. Uh, there's, you know, the kids are staying home from school, people are missing work. It's just a crazy time and there's a lot of unknowns. And hopefully today, I can either answer some of those unknowns for you or I can point you in the right direction. Because as you can see kind of from that slide that I've got right there, that picture showing everything coming at light speed is about the speed of which information is coming out about all of this right now. Um, so I'm trying to stay abreast of it just as fast as you are. And hopefully after today, you'll you'll take away some knowledge of it, or like I said before, you can you can know where to go. Uh, first of all, just as the next slide shows, this is mainly going to be for for just 
information. Uh, I'm not going to give out any legal advice specifically uh, just because I don't want to lead anybody down a wrong path, but hopefully this will be informative for you to where you can uh, you can get some information, and if you have any specific questions, feel free to call me. But as far as, you know, specific situations where, you know, I'll try to answer them as best I can uh, without, you know, creating an, an attorney-client relationship. But uh, the PDF that I've given is going to have a lot of information with a lot of uh, hyperlinks. So when you download this, you can click on the links. Uh, you know, for example, you can go to this just for that first uh, link that I clicked. We'll go and show you, you know, just all of the information for uh, the Department of State and Health Services here in Texas concerning the coronavirus and prevention of COVID-19, um, what to do if you're sick. So there's a lot of different resources there for you that you can have. Uh, for people that are business owners, especially those of us in small business, maybe you're in a larger business, but the business owners, I think right now are, are going to be leaned upon more than ever to provide the type of leadership that we're going to need. The first thing I think in any type of crisis situation is, is effective planning. Unfortunately, for something like this, we're, you know, we've got people that are working from home. Uh, in our office, we've given people the opportunity if they want to work from home, they can. Um, you know, we when we did this, we implemented some teleworking procedures. Not everybody's going to have that. Uh, not everybody's going to have data access policies for things that their employees are looking at on their servers. Uh, what kind of firewall do you have? Those things are important to recognize as this, you know, this quarantine and the shelter in place order stays and we don't know how long it's going to be. Hopefully, you know, they come in with a, uh, a cure for this or the, the curve flattens and all of this stuff lifts sooner rather than later. But the main thing is to, to come up with a plan, write it down. Um, uh, and it's a work in progress. So whatever it is, just be sure to, to come up with something because something's better than nothing. And once you come up with that plan, be sure to communicate that to everybody and, and make sure it gets to all of the, the important people and the employees in your organization to follow and be sure to execute that plan. So, you know, although it, it would have been great to have known, okay, everybody, uh, we're going to be shutting everything down two weeks from now, three weeks from now, go ahead and start planning. Uh, that's not the case. So unfortunately, it's sort of like closing the barn door after barn door after the horse got out. But in this type of situation, something is better than nothing. One thing I really want to talk about first that's going to be very important for everybody coming down the pipe is this Families First Coronavirus Response Act. It takes effect April 1st and it expires December 31st of, of this year. It's basically two parts. It, everybody probably knows about the Family Medical Leave Act, but this significantly expands it, uh, albeit on a temporary basis. Threshold coverage used to be uh, 50 or more employees, so FMLA didn't apply to small business. Now that's changed to where it applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. And it basically makes where any employee who's worked up at, at least 30 days prior to that designated leave can be eligible to receive that leave for up to 12 weeks. However, uh, small businesses employing fewer than 50 employees can be exempt if this expansion for both the Medical Leave Act and the Paid Leave Act, which we'll get to in a minute, if that would jeopardize the viability of your business. Um, with regard to the paid sick leave, the first, under the FMLA, uh, the first 10 days are unpaid, and after that, they get paid two-thirds of the regular rate. They can use uh, accrued personal or sick leave during the first 10 days. 
And then those payments that are made to, to the type of employees take, taking this particular leave is capped at $200 a day and $10,000 in the aggregate. Uh, it's, it's pretty confusing, but I'm trying to hit the high points of this, especially when you've got full-time versus part-time employees. And the part-time employees, they're going to be paid on the average number of hours worked for six months prior to taking their emergency FMLA. And people that have been working for less than six months, they get to take the reasonable expectation at hiring of the average number of hours normally scheduled to work. So basically, what would they have been paid had they been working? And that's going to be the paid leave that they can get under this act. Now, to this type of particular relief, this applies to what's called a qualifying need related to a public health emergency. And that's if the employee is unable to work or telework due to a need to leave to care for their child under the age of 18, if their school or place of care has been closed or the child care provider is unavailable. Now, if they leave and take this kind of leave, that job's got to be made available uh, for employers with they, if with 25 or more employees, they've got a, the obligation to return that employee to the same or equivalent position when they return. They're generally excluded though if you have less than 25 employees, if that position no longer exists because of an economic downturn or circumstances caused by a public health emergency. What is that? We really don't know right now. Um, the kicker is going to be is if that position's open and they leave uh, and that position is no longer available for them, you've got to make a reasonable attempt to return that employee to an equivalent position for up to a year after that employee's leave. Now, there are exemptions from this. And the first one is healthcare providers or emergency responders. They can elect to exclude these type of employees, which are you know, health care providers and emergency responders, however, those aren't defined. The next thing that can be done is, and this is all a work in progress, the Secretary of Labor can exempt businesses with fewer than 50 employees if the imposition of these requirements would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. So what that means is that, look, I, I, I'm not going to have enough money to, to meet these requirements. Um, there's guidelines that are, are going to be put in place. They're not there yet, but they're going to be there. And I think what this is going to require is going to require everybody to keep the type of financial records and payroll records to show the Department of Labor if and when this time comes that, hey, I couldn't make these payments. Um, I had to shut down completely. Uh, so it's going to be a total work in progress. The good news is, I guess, if there is any from this, is that, you know, each quarter, the employers that are subject to this requirement, uh, they do get a fully refundable tax credit that's equal to 100% of the FMLA wages that are paid. The next type of act under the F the called the FFCRA, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. And this applies to employers, again, with fewer than 500. It requires employers to provide employees with 10 days of paid sick leave. Remember, under the previous act, the first 10 days were unpaid. Now, um, they're, they're paid the 10 days when they can't work or telework for circumstances related to COVID-19. And then part-time employees, they're entitled to the number of hours of paid sick time equal to the number of hours they work on average over a two week period. Now, what is related to COVID-19? That's when they can't work or telework because they're subject to a government quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. And I think something like the shelter in place order yesterday would be, uh, could potentially affect this um, if they've been advised by health care providers to self-quarantine due to COVID-19. If they're trying to get a medical diagnosis because they think that they are uh, experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. If 
someone is caring for an individual that's subject to a quarantine order, or if they're caring for their children, if their schools are closed or caregivers unavailable because of the public health emergency or kind of the catch-all provision. And I'm not sure what this is just yet, but it's any other sub substantially similar condition that's to be specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretary of Treasury and the Treasury and the Secretary of Labor. All employees are, are eligible for this. The, the type of payments with their, that employees could get under this are capped at $511 per day and $5,110 in the aggregate, um, or $200 a day of $2,000 in the aggregate, but that's under the first type of leave. This type of leave is in addition to existing leave policies. They can't use, um, they can't be forced to use other paid leave before using the, the type of sick leave available to them under the emergency FMLA. Um, like I said, the rate of pay, that's I stated that earlier, that's 500 a day and $5,110 in the aggregate. Um, same, uh, benefit to the employer each quarter. Everybody gets, uh, if you, you make these payments, you get a fully refundable tax credit equal to the amount, 100% of the amount that you paid. And exemptions, the same exemptions apply for healthcare providers or emergency responders, uh, or same kind of thing when you've got 50 employees, uh, less than 50 employees, and when the imposition of these requirements would jeopardize your business as a going concern. Uh, so if that's gonna be the case, like I said before, be sure to keep t good records because there's run no real guidelines on this right now, but I'm sure those will be forthcoming. Um, and you can get that information probably on the websites that I'll show you uh, later on in the slideshow. Uh, these are guidelines from the Department of Labor uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, questions and answers. One of the net, the things that's going to be required is for people to have, uh, that was, I'm sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself. Uh, like I said before, with the documentations on, uh, meeting the criteria for an exemption, keep that. Uh, make sure you've got everything documented and those exemptions will be addressed. There's a new poster that's going to be coming out. It's already out that everybody's going to have to put in their workplace. And it's sort of like the ones that you already have regarding FMLA. I don't know if you can see that. That's on uh, the hyperlink in the in materials that are given to you. One thing that's uh, particular with the guard of enforcement for this, there's a temporary period of non-enforcement through April 17th. Now it goes into effect April 1st, but obviously there's going to be a lag where everybody's trying to scramble, number one, to figure out what all this is and what all they've got to do to comply with it. Um, if later on down the road, the wage and hour division comes in and, and does an audit, uh, one of the things that you're going to have to be able to show them is that if you acted reasonably in good faith, if, you know, after April 17th, when you came in or even before, uh, when you look, we, you know, you tell them that we, we figured out what was going on, we've remedied it, and you can show them that you've remedied, remedied it, you weren't knowingly trying to uh, short paying employees the wages that they were owed under this act, and if you receive uh, if you provide them with a written commitment to comply with the act in the future. So I know this is a lot of information, but hopefully the links to these websites can provide you with additional information if you have additional questions, which I'm sure you do, because I'm trying to understand this as quickly as it comes out in addition to making this PowerPoint. So uh, hopefully you can understand part of that if not, uh, be able to, to go find that information later on. Next thing I want to talk about is, is workplace safety. You know, everybody has a duty to make sure their employees are safe at work. There's OSHA guidance on preparing your workplaces for COVID-19. Uh, that's a, a PDF from OSHA that is 
going to be coming up here shortly. Uh, gives you a lot of guidance. Unfortunately, there's no specific OSHA requirement dealing with COVID. What they do tell you to do is to develop plans to make sure your employees are safe uh, and to follow the existing OSHA standards. You know, personal protective equipment. Uh, if you know that your employees are going to be subjected to certain types of risks that may require them using gloves, eye and face protection and respiratory protection. Uh, I've seen employees in stores now using gloves. Some of them are using masks when they're available. As everybody knows, there's a worldwide shortage of the N95 masks that are approved to uh, combat this type of virus from entering your lungs. They've even said, you know, with even with the shortage, bandanas could work anything. Um, but the main thing to remember is that, you know, employers do have a duty to furnish their employees with a place uh, of employment that's free from recognized hazards. So I think the main thing that you've got to do is to go in and, uh, you know, implement all of the social distancing requirements in your place of employment. Uh, make sure that you've got policies with regard to uh, people hygiene, they're washing their hands, uh, you know, maintaining those types of, of good uh, hygiene requirements that are put down by the CDC that most everyone, if not everybody, knows about right now. Uh, issues for employers and employees, there's a lot of information out there from the Texas Workforce Commission, mainly on unemployment benefits. The uh, There's a, a information on the shared work program, and that's something that the Texas Workforce Commission has put out that allows an uh, you know employees to work part time and to receive the the part wages they were paid and the partial unemployment benefits. So for if their hours are reduced by an amount uh, between 10 and 40 percent, then they you know that's something that could be available to employers in the state of Texas. Uh, it also provides information on sick leave versus unemployment and what to do regarding employees who are or may be sick. You know, if if uh, people are calling in saying, look, I, I think I might be sick, I might need to stay home, make them stay home. Uh, don't make them come in because not only if you do do that, then potentially you could be placing yourself and your employees at risk for being for contracting this virus, which obviously everybody knows that, that they doesn't they do not want that to happen. There's also information in the spreadsheet on mass claims. Uh, the program that the Workforce Commission has for unemployment benefits when there's multiple people being laid off, as well as COVID-19 resources for employees. Uh, there's a wealth of information out there. And hopefully with regard to your employees, you can find this information from these websites. There may be specific questions you have. Uh, if you do have specific questions, you know, feel free to contact me or, or if you already have an attorney to contact them and hopefully they can lead you in the right direction. Uh, the next thing that I want to address, and it's not in the spreadsheet because I didn't have time to, to do that, is the, the stimulus package that just came out. Uh, there's a lot of information on the, uh, the Small Business Administration website, and I'll have that link here for you. But just kind of the highlights of this, uh, as people may or may not know now, it's providing, you know, uh, $1,200 payments to individuals making $75,000 uh, a year, up to $99,000 a year. That's kind of the range or $2,400 to married couples if their household income is uh, $150,000 up to $198,000 plus $500 per child. So, and that's in the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the, the CARES Act that recently passed the Senate yesterday and is expected to pass the House today by voice vote. Uh, one of the some of the things that that's going to do is there's a 
$350 billion forgivable loan program to ensure that small businesses don't lay off employees, a 50% refundable payroll tax credit to incentivize employers to retain empl their workers, uh, a delay in employer side payroll taxes for Social Security uh, t payroll taxes until 2021 or 2022. <clears throat> in particular, one of the most interesting things on this is for sole proprietors and other self-employed workers who usually don't get unemployment benefits, uh, it makes them eligible for expanded unemployment insurance that's going to be set out in this package. And a portion of the $425 billion that's been allotted for the Fed's credit facility expansion is going to target small businesses. Uh, it's going to also going to distribute $350 billion, uh, and this is kind of this is part of the loan program that I talked about earlier to small businesses that can, uh, and these these loans can uh, partially be forgiven if certain requirements are met. Um, and those forgiveness provisions are primarily for payroll uh, payments that are being made, payment of interest obligations for mortgage, uh, and payment of rent, uh, and payment of covered utilities. I'm not sure what the covered utilities are right now, but uh, this is just came down the pipe yesterday, so there's going to be a lot of information coming from that. I kind of went on the Small Business Administration's website yesterday, and it took about four or five times to uh, get through. So there's going to be a massive lag in people getting these benefits, but they're going to be out there and made available to you. As far as business things that are going to happen, you know, what I recommend for everybody right now, if you're operating under certain contracts with suppliers, vendors, uh, take a look at them. See what they say, because in in this particular environment, that you know, there's and there's a I could spend all day talking about various types of contract issues and whether or not they're enforceable under this type of situation. But what we don't know right now is is this, you know, under these types of scenarios, you know, it may very well be that those contracts are are impossible are impossible to perform because of everything that's going on. Uh, there may be what's called force majeure or act of God provisions in those contracts that keep them from being performed or that allow uh, basically the contract to be terminated. You just don't know until you look at them. Other things to look at are your insurance policies. You know, there, if you have business interruption insurance, I have no idea whether or not that type of business interruption will be covered or not under this scenario, but look at it, call your agent. Uh, if you have employees that contract the virus on the job, make sure you have you know, workers' compensation coverage or uh, you know, be sure to review that and make sure it's available to your employees. The next thing to talk about, and this may have been addressed yesterday with the banker, I wasn't on that call, but the uh, you know cash flow obviously is huge right now for everybody because people are obviously not going to be paying their bills. So what do you do? Um, the main thing right now is to reach out to your lenders, your creditors, your landlords, and do it sooner rather than later. Uh, get some sort of plan in place. If you can't make your payments, uh, maybe some sort of forbearance agreement can be entered, uh, especially, you know, if you deal with local banks uh, and you know your lenders, uh, those they'd much rather hear from you and to put some sort of plan in place to, uh, you know, at least get something going in the short term and to uh, be able to stem the tide until we have a, a better you know outlook on what's going to happen. Specifically with people that have rental properties. The Supreme Court came down uh, last week and said that uh, all evictions, trials, or hearings, those are told until after April 19th, and I think that's even been amended to May 1st. Uh, people that have do have writs of possession, they can issue, but they can't be posted on the properties until after April 26th. You can file a petition for eviction 
but issuance and service of the citation can occur until April 19th. People that do have rental properties, they still can be ev evictions that take place, but you've got to file a sworn petition and, and you've got to go to the court and make sure that it can only be done if the court finds that the tenant poses an imminent threat of physical harm to the plaintiff, the plaintiff's employees or other tenants, and if there's criminal activity, and if the court signs an order stating that these procedures have been met in order to, for the case to proceed. Uh, the next bullet point, like I said earlier, you know, discuss those solutions and everything that you've got going with your lenders or creditors, specifically your short-term needs and your long-term needs. Who knows what's going to happen, but it's better to have a plan in place rather than to put your head in the sand and, and hope this all goes away, because as we all know, that does not work. Uh, this link right here, this goes to the this is the final hyperlink that goes to the, the SBA website for the disaster loan package and shows for the uh, the loan program and the bridge loans and a lot of guidance for business and employers. So that's the, the conclusion of my presentation. And so that's available for download. And so you can go to each one of those websites and look at those to determine if it applies to you. And hopefully that each one of those, uh, those links can answer specific questions that you may have about these types of issues. The hardest part is going to be the implementation of all of this uh, from a small business standpoint. So it, there's really not a lot of uh, information out there on how to implement that. That's one thing I'm working on right now is to uh, go, you know, what to do, forms, that sort of thing. Um, I imagine that that's coming. So uh, the main thing is to be prepared for it. Uh, especially before April 1st, when all of these uh, these acts go into effect. So hopefully that's been uh, of some assistance to you. And I've, that's everything I know of right now. Um, not everything I know of right now, but all the information that I have. If there's specific questions, I'll be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. All right. Casey, thank you so much. Lots of lots of information, um, and uh, and thank you for providing all those links in there too. That's going to be really helpful um, when people get the PDF. They can go back and and look at some of that stuff. We have um, a few questions, and uh, I'm going to throw the first one out to you. It's really more of a statement than a question, but maybe we can offer a little bit of guidance here. Um, it says, "I'm a property manager. Rather than employees, I have tenants. The amount of information to sort through is massive." It seems that we each need a financial advisor to sort through it and sift the chaff from the wheat. Yeah, on deal, you know, people like that or that are uh, sole proprietors or maybe have their assets tied up in an LLC where they're just collecting rent. Um, the main thing, if that to for people to know about that is if their employees or if their tenants can't pay their rent, uh, go work with them go talk to them and see what they can do. If they can't pay, then, uh, you know, the eviction procedures that I said earlier have been suspended. Um, I think that in this type of crisis, that, um, you know, a measured response is better than a total, uh, you know, nuclear bomb as far as trying to get everybody out at once, if everybody's not paying, obviously that's not going to do anybody any good in the short term or the long term. So uh, if you do need a financial advisor, there are people out there. I would imagine that if people have tenants instead of uh, employees, then they have CPAs. They're working right now just as hard as lawyers are. They're been deemed essential to our workforce. So they're out there working. Not only that, they're trying to uh, understand all of these guidelines just as, as uh, fast as lawyers are, so they may not have the best guidance for you except for just <clears throat> general business practices. So talk to them as well. Good deal. Okay. So we have another question. Um, this one says, if we have 13 stores and 571 employees, do we qualify? Is it total employees or full-time? 
I don't believe that does qualify because uh, if you're a private employer and you have over 500 employees, then the act does not apply to you. I think in that particular instance, then you would go to uh, your specific uh, sick leave policies. And uh, if you do massive layoffs, then uh, you've got WARN Act, and that is uh, a specific act that applies to uh, warning that's needed to be given to each employee if you're laying off at least 50 people at a single site over a 30-day period, and you've got to provide them with at least uh, 60 calendar days notice in advance of the, a plant closing or a mass layoff. So it's a, at least my reading of this is that it, in that type of situation, this does not apply to uh, a, what I would deem to be a large employer like that. So the the over five hundred number that it doesn't matter if they're full time or part time if if it's a total count. Correct. Okay. Okay. And there's a, um, I believe there's a link in uh, that website to um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act questions and answers. Um, I don't know if, if people can still see that right now on my screen. They. they yeah, they should be able to. Yeah. So there's it goes through and, and answers a lot of questions like that. Specifically says, like, if, if I'm a private sector employer and I have 500 or more employees, do the act apply to me? And it says no. So I believe that that answered that question. Okay, good. Here's the next one. If we furloughed everyone, do we get to pay them at home? Yes. Uh, well, and, and I, but I believe that that kind of begs a question as well as to, you know, how many employees do they have? And, uh, you know, if it was a smaller, uh, you know, smaller uh, type of business, then then I, it kind of all depends. So, but my, my reading of that is that uh, it would have to be complied with, even in the event of... Uh, you know, a uh, layoff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and we then the thing enough. is, I think that they, you know, they can uh, go, you can get the tax credit for that and uh, also apply to the SBA for the loans to cover uh, these type of payments that are being made. Okay, good. Then the next question is did you say that mandated shelter in place qualifies for the paid leave program? I believe it does, uh, simply because it's a mandate that came down from a governmental agency. You know, I, that's open to that's going to be open to interpretation. There's no litigation on this right now. Obviously, there's no cases that have come down where a uh, court has said, but I would imagine. In my opinion, I would think that since the uh, mandatory shelter in place has come down from both the city and the county uh, and your business is non-essential, then I think it would apply. Okay. But and like I said, the, the relief there is you get the tax credit and you can get the loan from the SBA to cover that cost. Okay, and then here's here is one uh, about nonprofits. Um, any specific instruction or direction for nonprofits at this time, and and you might want to differentiate if if necessary between 501c3 and 501c6. I I believe that it applies to both uh, profits and not for profit and nonprofit. Uh, at least that's my understanding of that right now. You know, this is all a uh, a complete and total work in progress. So that could change at any particular time. All right, and then I have one final question. So if, if you're out there and you haven't asked your question yet, now's the time to get it in there. Um, last question, I have: if I have a new employee who hasn't been with the company 30 days, does the FFCRA apply? Okay, that, 
if they haven't been there for 30 days at least prior Correct. to, uh, I don't believe that that would apply. Uh, I think that they've got to be employed for at least 30 calendar days uh, for the purposes of this act. And I, and I think that's what I've read as well. All right. So at this point, uh, we have had no further questions. Uh, like I said, this, you know, uh, it's a rapidly evolving situation. And I uh, these questions that have been asked, you know, I've been studying this as fast as I can. So take that with a grain of salt uh, and be sure to, you know, check up on that. If you have any specific questions to call you know me or another attorney and to get you know specific advice on those issues good deal and then um I've been asked will you share your screenshots with us, and the screenshots are included in the p d f right that we're gonna give to them uh the screenshots those like if i go if I leave the screen right now and um let me go to like to one of well, the hyperlinks. Right. Those well, the hyperlinks, the links are there, but not not the whole screen, correct? In your present, the yes, presentation you, you're giving to them is your is your PowerPoint. Yes, in the on the PDF, you should be able to once you download it to click on that link as well, and it's not just in PowerPoint; it's in PDF as well. So that should right uh, work, and that's why. Yeah, otherwise it would have been. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't help you very much. So yeah, that's why I'm <laughs> saying, uh, when you download that in PDF format, even when you open it in PDF, uh, you'll be able to click on that hyperlink and it'll take you to the uh, the specific web page. Good deal. Well, lots of great information. Some good questions there. I'm sure that, uh, again, you know, with every answer, there's six more questions in mind <laughs> that come up over time. Um, but there's lots of great resources out there. Um, you know, a lot of the things that, that uh, Casey included in, in this PowerPoint that will be in the PDF. Um, also on our website, longviewchamber.com, we have a COVID-19 section. Um, it's listed at on the top uh, toolbar on the website, and there's lots of information there. If you have specific questions, um, uh, especially related to local things. Uh, if you email a staff member at the chamber and you can find our emails on the website, we'd be happy to try to get you some information. We've we've done that for quite a few folks already. And uh, so we're always, always here ready to help you, uh, even if we're not in the office. If we're not in the office, we'll be working remotely, so we'll, st we'll still be working. Um, I want to thank uh, Casey for taking time out of uh, your schedule today to help us think through some of these next steps and preparing for, for what's to come. Um, and uh, we're certainly glad to uh, have Boonecock, Eccles, Coleman, and Goolsby as a uh, as a member investor with the Longview Chamber of Commerce. So we appreciate you guys. Um, I, I, one of our roles as is, is the chamber uh, in this community is to help create an economic environment that allows prosperity to occur. And uh, and so we're working towards that every day. And we're going to come through this. Uh, we're going to come through this stronger as a community. And, uh, and and we're going to be with you every step of the way. So, again, on behalf of the Longview Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate those of you on the line for participating. And just as one final reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on our website. And you'll also receive an email with a link so that you can listen to it again. All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, everybody have a, a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.